Good morning. First of all, uh, thank you for taking this conference to Hong Kong. I'm so thankful to all the uh, Alfred and Housen Society, the LSE, as well as the University of Hong Kong uh, for organizing this. Uh, it is a very important subject on urban planning, particularly relating to our population demographic changes. So I'm, uh, I'd like to spend about 20 minutes to tell you a little bit about what we are doing. But responding to what uh, the, uh, that I've said about Sun Yat Sen, I have to tell you that Sun Yat Sen is the first medical graduate of Hong Kong. Um, at that time, there's only 11 students. He came first, and there's only another pass, which is a sub actually a supplementary pass. The only e inequality is after he graduates, he's not allowed to practice in Hong Kong because of all these uh, British uh, doctors who are practicing in Hong Kong at that time. So he has to go to Macau and start his practice. So I think things has changed now. We have to ensure that everything is done in, in, in coordination and able to um, uh, um, <coughs> uh, face the uh, demand and also expectation of a society. Um, okay. Now, I think the, the topic is health and well-being, and I don't like to uh, spend too much time defining these two because I believe there are other sessions to go into the look at those. But it is very important that any society with health and well-being, it would lead to productivity, it would lead to progress, it would lead to stability. And if anything happens to either of the three, it would also inversely uh, affects the uh, health and well-being of the whole community, uh, whole community. And this is the responsibility of governments to ensure uh, that we have a healthy and uh, uh, a well-balanced uh, community uh, in our society. Uh, in Hong Kong, we always say that we are very proud to be a small government. But in the recent years, we find that uh, in certain areas, particularly in commercial areas, that we like to have a free competition. Uh, but in certain areas, uh, the government need to take a leading role as well. Um, my understanding of well-being to be uh, very, very brief is it has to be safe for everyone. It's a caring society. You need to respect freedom, human rights, and it's to be a fair society. That means everybody would have an equal opportunity within our society to move on to any endeavor that actually they, they like to do. And for health, I think uh, we are not just concerning about physical health, we're also concerned about mental health. We're talking about actually the uh, perhaps even spiritual health because I think that's uh, very important uh, for everyone. And we usually divide the government role in public health and health care. Health care and public health is definitely a government's responsibility. We never treat that as a commercial business. So this is very important that in our philosophy, we need to uh, look at the government's role in both um, in designing, in planning, and leading, as well as in regulating uh, our activities. You have much better uh, diagrams and maps in the publication you have produced. But this is the satellite picture of Hong Kong, which shows that uh, because of our very mountainous terrain, uh, there's only a limited area for development. And for people who like uh, nature, we have 40% of our land is country park. So you can see this is perhaps one of the greenest part of the uh, Kwangtung Tung province. In fact, if you take a satellite picture, you find that Hong Kong is actually one of the greenest area in the whole region. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about our objective. I can only mention in a macro way rather than looking at some of the meso and the uh, micro type of innovation that we are doing or the science we are doing. But I think it's important to note that in public health, we must try to maintain a low risk environment for everybody. Uh, in fact, uh, we concentrate on the infectious diseases because uh, like <coughs> any densely populated city, 
uh, this is always a very high risk uh, uh, for any city. And Hong Kong is particularly so because, not only because we have a large population of 7 million people living in a very close area, but at the same time, we have a lot of people traveling back and forth, and also from the mainland, from the uh, various other uh, countries to Hong Kong, and, and, and so on. Uh, just across the border to the mainland alone, every day we have over 300,000 people. So you can imagine if any infectious disease occur, uh, it is hardly possible to screen everybody crossing the border every day. And of course, as a responsible government, we need to ha keep health data in terms of uh, very vital statistics and all very, very timely information that we gather. Um, I noticed today that I think it is under, I said that from LSE that published we are the one of the longest living population in Hong Kong with almost 83 years. Of course, that's something we are proud of. It's also something we worry about. <coughs> uh, in Hong Kong, our statistics shows that the average longevity of men is 80, and for women is close to 86. Uh, women is definitely a, a more su superior uh, species, I think, in that area. But I think it's important to, to note that uh, it is not just longevity that counts, it's the quality of life that counts. And we want to make sure that our elderly folks are able to enjoy life, able to uh, be productive, able to uh, maintain their well-being, uh, even they, uh, they are getting into the uh, later stage of their lives. And of course, preventive health is important and health education, health information, uh, uh, this is also a very important um, responsibility of the government. We, over the years, uh, we have built two important centers. One is the Center for Health Protection. This follows the, um, uh, I believe you, you all experienced in some part of the world, is the SARS incidents in Hong Kong in 2003. So the center was set up in 2004. Uh, and now we are able to monitor all the infectious diseases in the region, and particularly in Hong Kong. And I get the report every week regarding the incidence and also the trend of different infectious diseases on, <coughs> on my computer every day, every week. And at the same time, um, we are able to communicate with the various authorities in the region and also at WHO on any emergent and, and re-emergent diseases. Uh, this is a very important part. And <coughs> apart from infectious disease, we are also moving on to non-communicable diseases. We notice that the burden of NCD is much higher. Uh, there, was, there was a, um, a, a United Nations high-level meeting just in, uh, in September uh, regarding this. And we noticed perhaps the, the most important burden in future would be on chronic diseases, on cancer, and, and so on. So these are the things that we need to concentrate on. And now with the progress of technology, and medicine, uh, you are not talking about how to look after cancer patients and, and how they actually pass on with the, uh, in the terminal stage. Many people actually have cancers that are treated, recover, and then you have developed a different type of cancer in the, in the later years. So this is very important for us to concentrate on how to prevent and screen certain type of cancers and at the same time uh, educate people to uh, to, no, to note their own health status so that they can come off for treatment as early as possible. Uh, we also have regular review of our vaccination policy. In the recent few years, we have uh, increased the vaccination for influenza and also subsidizing them, uh, the elderly and also the, the, the young population. Uh, we make sure that those people who cannot afford to have vaccination will have it free of charge. Um, and for disease surveillance, as I mentioned earlier on, it is very important for us to follow uh, the disease pattern. Uh, in recent years, of course, because of the change of diet, because of the change of lifestyle, uh, we are seeing more chronic diseases related to the cardiovascular system, diabetes, and so on. And all population, public health uh, authorities need to regulate. So we are regulating pharmaceutical products, we are regulating uh, various things, and at the moment, I think what, what I actually mentioned today, we are also looking at some of the health products like uh, powdered milk and so on. 
uh, to ensure that uh, the pop population were well informed of the risks and also uh, the, the perhaps sometimes the, the, the claims of certain products. So health information and information uh, actually involves a lot of work uh, from various sectors. And for healthcare, our philosophy is we need to ensure that everybody would have an equal access for care and we should have a safety net for all. So we, there's a common saying that, that nobody should be deprived of care for lack of means. And uh, a robust public system is important. And we have a very highly subsidized public system which look after a lot of patients, particularly the sick and also the severely sick in Hong Kong. And because of that, we need to maintain the international healthcare standard and the medical standard. This re actually relates to various professional expertise and, and various professions. Uh, another area that we are very concerned and we are very proud of at the same time is the professional ethics of our, our medical carers. Uh, as you know that doctor-patient relationship is never equal. Doctors always can advise patients to receive treatments actually when they're desperate. So it is important to, to ensure uh, the professional ethics is up to a certain standard and nobody would get inappropriate treatment or uh, unnecessary treatment. Um, we also need to look after certain sector of the community uh, because the with public system, there are always some disadvantage and there's also some other uh, associated uh, problems like uh, long queues and also waiting time and so on. So a private service is also uh, one of the uh, options for those people who can afford it. So uh, we feel that it's also important for us to regulate the private sector. And this initiative only started only seven years ago um, and I think with uh, different types of initiatives. And at the end of the day, we've got to make sure that our system is sustainable financially. Healthcare can be a bottomless pit when it comes to financing. And always you have supply, you always generate demand as well. So it is important to ensure public funding will go to the appropriate and also the uh, important essential services and not put to any waste. So this is a very challenging subject which I believe every government is facing right now. In the public healthcare system, we developed the hospital authority, which developed in 1990 and uh, both put into function in 1992. Uh, we set up certain priority for them because uh, we, we understand that uh, you cannot care for everybody at the same time, uh, so we need to have some priorities. So the priorities is look after the poor and the needy, those people who cannot afford to have private care, who have no other access of care. And of course, also in emergency uh, services, we make sure this actually combines with the ambulance services and various rescue services. Uh, one area I think uh, Hong Kong is particularly keen is we need to also develop the expertise as well as the um, follow the international trend of medical development. So we also invest into high risk, high cost and high tech services. Things like transplant, things like uh, very uh, advanced uh, type of research in cancer uh, and chronic diseases and so on. And the last element uh, we are very um, also, we also think that it's very important is the public system should be also the nurturing ground for healthcare professionals so that they can have the good exposure of the experience of different types of patients. They can also maintain a good ethical practice because in the public system, uh, whether you see more patients or not, you're still uh, being rewarded in the same way. I think this is something that's very important, particularly in, uh, uh, in a, a community like Hong Kong. And at the moment, I, uh, there are several levels of care. So this is just for, to, to tell you that the primary care side, we have about 30% of public go to the uh, public hospitals, uh, and also 70% of them are being cared for by the private general practitioners. And in hospital care, uh, we look after 90% in the public sector and private 10%. And many of the tertiary care, that is very high level care, would be uh, only done in specialized centers and also in our public hospitals. 
um, looking at the development of Hong Kong, most of the population are gravitated in around the harbor area. So many of the hospitals in the past were built around those areas. But in the recent years, we have uh, enlarged our urban area to very uh, a, a more, more distant areas, in, including the Lantau Island, including the Northern District, uh, including the, um, the, the, some of the eastern part of New Territories. So uh, now healthcare service is really divided into seven clusters. And each cluster would have services including primary care, uh, acute hospital of a certain standard, which have an excellent emergency. We have some essential specialties in, in emergency, in medicine, surgery, orthopedics, gynecology, and obstetrics, and so on. Uh, and they also have extended care and convalescent care and rehabilitation services as well. So it is very much a self-contained uh, design for a cluster, um, except a few things like specialized services. What I'm talking about is like a liver transplant center and things like that. It's only done in one hospital. Uh, we also look at mental health because mental health is not just a uh, uh, health care done by the <coughs> hospital authority alone. It requires also a lot of community support from the um, welfare sector as well. So I think this is uh, also designed a different way. <coughs> as I said earlier, on some of the tertiary centers are designed so that it can look after special services. Uh, we're also planning to build uh, two centers. One is for children, one is for uh, neuroscience, because we feel that in these two areas, uh, there is a need to concentrate expertise and develop uh, a good uh, area for uh, future development and research. So some of the pictures of uh, late uh, we developed hospitals and some of the very traditional hospitals. Queen Mary is one of the oldest, and so is Queen Elizabeth, but I think there are new buildings building on uh, in order to expand their services. Uh, rehabilitation hospitals are more spacious. They have also uh, more facilities uh, for people to stay longer and, and, and develop their uh, physical and, and uh, functional skills. Uh, Kowloon Hospital and Taipo Hospital is another one. Uh, more district hospitals were built in some of the satellite towns. Uh, Changquan O is one of the latest and so is uh, Pao Oi Hospital. And we are building also two others right now. One is um, in, uh, near the airport in, in uh, Tong Chong and then the other one is in uh, Tin Shui Wai, which is in the very uh, more distant part of the uh, northern uh, part uh, and northern e western part of uh, uh, Yunlong. And of course, talking about hardware, we need to also look at software. And quality and quantity is also important. Uh, continuous education, accreditation, and professional boards and councils. Uh, <coughs> Uh, I think it's no different for many of the developed communities. The surface design we concentrate on would be need to be patient center. Uh, we need to have a standardized facilities and equipment. That means anybody go to different acute hospitals would be more or less the same uh, facilities and, and equipments they can get. I think uh, we invest a lot on <coughs> uh, the medical equipment. So one of we are one of the. Uh, most uh, well-equipped uh, communities in terms of medical equipments in Hong Kong. Uh, we form a f drug formulary because uh, this is important because there's so many new drugs coming on the market and some are very good, some are not so good, and some are actually not actually superior than the old ones. So this is important for us to ensure uh, with the expert advice that we've given by the various uh, clinical experts. Uh, we, we we try to ensure that we have the right mix of um, uh, medicine for our patients. Uh, of course, uh, this would be reviewed regularly and on, a, on a, at least a six month uh, basis so that new drugs will be added on, old drugs will be taken out. Um, and our, what I mean, drug form is something that is heavily subsidized by the government. And so some new drugs, they also start to have a, a subsidy uh, to, to see whether uh, this is actually uh, uh, sustainable. And we also have by uh, uh, Samaritan Fund and also external funds in order to ensure uh, some of the new drugs are made available to the uh, appropriate patients. And like all services, particularly professional services, 
we need to have a cl uh, clinical audit uh, on a regular basis. And for Hong Kong, we also make a very important policy that we need to tell people what happens in the hospital. Hospital is not necessarily all safe. There are things happening there all day. Uh, and we've got to make sure that a, a event reporting system is there. First of all, it's non-punitive so that people get a, a volunteer, we will volunteer to, to report. At the same time, if something that's really serious, we need to actually inform the public as well. So this uh, type of transparency policy is extremely important. Uh, another area we look at is healthcare findings, financing. The public system is heavily subsidized. It costs us 40 billion Hong Kong dollars a year. Uh, that is about 2.5% of our GDP. And our total healthcare expenditure in Hong Kong is roughly about 5% of GDP. So half come from the private side, our pocket insurance, and half actually come from the government. Um, in the government, uh, we subsidize very high level. Anybody come to our clinics have to pay $45 for uh, a general outpatient, that is GP type of clinic. Uh, and for those who come to specialist clinic, they pay $60. And each, each drug that would amount to perhaps a uh, three month supply would cost them extra $10. So in, in fact, it's very high, heavy, heavily subsidized service. For hospital inpatient care, they pay $100 uh, a day, and irrespective of what they receive. So they can have a liver transplant, which they stay for 10 days. So all they pay is 1,000 Hong Kong dollars. And of course, uh, for that, each of the transplant would cost perhaps the government about $800,000. So it's a very heavy subsidized uh, service. But we believe this is very important to upkeep the health standard of our, our citizens. Uh, but despite of that, we still need to uh, have cost control and some standardization of fees. And the government, this term of government, we have been able to increase the recurrent funding on, pub, uh, on public health and health care from 15 to 70 percent of our government expenditure. Uh, the increase of the 2% roughly amounts to a recurrent expenditure of $10 billion per year. Um, can I go back? Yes, sorry. Okay, there are challenges, of course, with a public system like that. So, uh, because we know that the capacity needs to be increased. Uh, at the moment, there are about uh, 12 to 13 percent of our population is above the age of 65. And in 15 to 20 years, this will amount to about 25 percent. That is from one eighth to one quarter. So we expect the need for health care will be much greater. Uh, so we need to ensure that we have uh, sustainable resources to keep up with that. So the demand for the capacity, the long waiting time, uh, and also the cost control is important. And at the moment, yes, you, I've told you earlier, there's some unbalanced public and private market as well. So we need to address that. So our plan <coughs> is to try to enhance the development also of the private market, but make sure they also acquire the same quality and transparency as the public side. So we uh, try to give healthcare vouchers in people in the um, uh, testing the, the market. We also subsidize the vaccination program that we deliver by the private sector. Uh, we also buy service from the private sector in terms of cataract operations and so on. Uh, we also try to um, uh, influence the private hospitals. So now everybody agree that they would unify the hospital accreditation system and also invest into the electronic health record system. Um, because of the uh, demand for public and also public services, I think we also would expand some of the public hospitals, uh, build new hospitals in certain areas, but at the same time, we're also putting out four pieces of land. We'll be putting out four pieces of land for public hospital options. Uh, so this will be uh, something that we we'll do in the next year. The accreditation system is so important that uh, because they would is ensure that all the public and private hospital would have the same uh, quality of uh, monitoring of their standards. 
uh, at the moment, we are, we are using the Australian Council on Healthcare Standards, which we developed uh, together with the ACHS. So um, uh, there will be about uh, 60 uh, inspectors, both from uh, locally being uh, nurtured, together with the international ones to go around to do the system uh, accreditation scheme. We expect the scheme will be completed for all hospitals within three to four years. The other very important infrastructure is the electronic health record system. I think uh, we have already a very robust system within the public, public sector, but not yet rolled out to the public one. In the, in the recent two years, we start to have sharing of information with the public sector, which has been proven quite successful. But we need to move into a new platform so that it will be a patient-based type of uh, electronic health record system. So the only individuals uh, can authorize uh, access to his records by the, uh, by the individual himself. So he can authorize certain hospitals, certain clinics to have access. And he can also stop that if he's not happy with that. So I think this is a, a, a new, new concept which we're having, we going to be introduced and put into implementation in 2014. Uh, this will improve healthcare. This will ensure uh, there will proper referrals and communication and facilitate clinical audit and quality control. Uh, in some way, it will also support research and reporting. Uh, and, and of course, uh, with that system, we also need to ensure that privacy is well protected. Uh, talk a little bit about healthcare financing because all the time we are using taxpayers' money for our public system. Uh, we do not actually have any control on the public expenditure. But uh, knowing that increase in costs, particularly in technology, we have to introduce a regulated uh, insurance scheme, particularly for the uh, people who can afford it. So we decided that uh, after two consultations in 2008 and 2010, uh, that we need to introduce this voluntary medical insurance system. Uh, we'll be able to set standard and regulate it together with the support of the, the stakeholders. Uh, there will be some subsidy so that we can sustain the coverage, particularly for the elderly. Uh, we enhance, uh, this would enhance the private hospital uh, and also the, uh, the regulation of private services because of uh, all these schemes. We expect that with the 10% of inpatients now look after the uh, inpatients, uh, we can expect that there will be a certain growth in this percentage up to perhaps 20% to 25% in about uh, 15 to 20 years. So as a conclusion, uh, I think uh, time will not allow me to go into a lot of details. It's only a very macro approach to, to this subject. Uh, healthcare design is a very complex process. In fact, in fact uh, in, involves many stakeholders. Uh, but some elements we need to control, particularly as the government, one is the market, one is the manpower and expertise, and more importantly is the professional ethics, which is going to determine on the quality as well as the sustainability of a system. The government needs to supply the essential and the basic services, and we must make sure it is sustainable financially. So with that, I'd like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to share with you some of the things we are doing. Uh, I'm much more looking forward to listening to many of your speakers and experts uh, coming today and also perhaps uh, participating in the discussion later on. Thank you very much. Why don't you stay for a minute for, for discussion? I think, thank you very much, uh, Professor Shaw, for this very informative uh, uh, talk on, on health and well-being in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, <clears throat> I think we should take time for a couple of direct questions and then enter the general discussion afterwards. May I start taking up uh, Ricky's remark, there's nothing more important than health. Health is, is the most important law. What is uh, uh, your, the position as Secretary of Health and Well-being in Hong Kong with respect to all the other departments? You feel you have the influence in Hong Kong to do what you need to do that to meet the challenges. Uh, is health the priority you would uh, ask for? Um, the government is basically funding all the public systems, including the public health system as well as the public healthcare system. So in a way, the government actually have the authority to do that. 
of course, the, uh, we also need to have some freedom for people to innovate. And the private services, uh, we allow them to be uh, able to compete with each other. But of course, the recent uh, demand from the public is we have to make sure that they are also as transparent, like the, the public system. And secondly, the quality of care need to be monitored. Uh, I think we have the professional system at the medical council, at the nursing council, we look at the professions. Uh, if they do something that is below the certain standard or actually in, in, in conflict with the co-op practice, of course, uh, they would be uh, uh, disciplined in, in, in a way. Uh, but I think it's important for us to ensure that uh, the essential elements that I mentioned earlier on, uh, the standard of care, the capacity of care, uh, some of the uh, ethical standards that we need to monitor. And I think the government actually do have the authority and the power to do so through our laws, through our regulation scheme, uh, and perhaps also through a lot of peer pressure within the, the system. And within the government, they listen to you? Um, our government, you're talking about our government, actually our government has three parts. One is the executive role, which is uh, our responsibility. The other is the legislative council, which actually monitors the government. At the same time, they ensure the right laws are being passed and being, being, being uh, enforced. And the, th the third one, of course, is the judiciary, which will address some of the, uh, uh, the, the conflicts <laughs> and try to make the, the right judgment. Okay. Okay. Further questions? Please uh, mention your name and where you come from. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, Dr. Chow, I, I noticed in your PowerPoint uh, very encouragingly that you include environmental health as part of your total package. Now, in Hong Kong, I think some areas of environmental health is not actually within uh, your uh, purview. And I wonder, for example, uh, where the public health uh, community as well as the environmental community have been urging uh, that the air quality standards in Hong Kong should really come under um, uh, uh, the control of, of your department, because that's really where you have public health uh, expertise. Uh, how do you see, um, uh, how do you see what, what, what you can do to, to, <coughs> to in a way, fill out this gap in Hong Kong's public health? Well, I think we have a secretary for environment, so he has to have some work, right? uh, You cannot just, <laughs> but on the other hand, I think the, the secretary for environment will look after a much broader perspective of the, the, the macro environment. Uh, for, I think, uh, for our department, uh, our, our government's role, uh, in a way we, we work with, with each other all the time. Our Department of Health experts also uh, give advice to the, uh, the Secretary for Environment in de determining some of the standards and so on. Uh, but it is important to, to note that um, in a small government like Hong Kong, uh, we actually work very closely together. There are many issues that we, cross, we need to cross bureau in order to, to uh, come to a certain uh, policy. So uh, I think that there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but very importantly, we have to monitor the effects of certain environmental risks so that uh, we can help the other bureaus. So in a way, we are monitoring the, the, um, uh, the, um, the number of people who are suffering from, say, uh, respiratory diseases and, and, and asthma and so on to see whether that is something that is, uh, uh, would be relevant to some of the regulation uh, that is uh, being enforced by the other bureaus. And for that matter, I think I need to mention another thing that we are responsible for it actually is the smoking control, tobacco control. And this is something that we feel that uh, Hong Kong has done something that very drastically in the last uh, few years, and particularly we're able to uh, reduce the smoking rate from almost 20 something percent 20 years ago to down to now 11.1. So this is something that I think is related to uh, our effort in both our bureau and department, but also in the community as a whole. Okay, I see three more questions. Yes, please. Bruce Raymond, Los Angeles. Uh, two quick questions, Professor. Um, uh, first is um, uh, most of the medicine is delivered here, uh, Eastern or Western, or uh, doesn't it make any difference? And so I know it makes a difference. And secondly, uh, with uh, what medical uh, institutions and facilities outside of Hong Kong uh, do you have your most uh, serious, uh, direct, and constant ties? Um, the mainstream of medicine is Western medicine. So I think uh, all of the hospitals that I mentioned, the 41 hospitals within the hospital authorities are all practicing uh, Western medicine. 
Chinese medicine is mainly a primary care type of setup. We have, at the moment, 15 clinics of Chinese medicine that is sponsored or supported by the government. But many of these Chinese medicine clinics are individual clinics run by the practitioners themselves. We start to regulate the Chinese medicine practitioners and the uh, Chinese medicine itself in two, the year 2000, so it's almost now 11 years down the road. Uh, we're able to uh, register about 7,000 uh, Chinese medicine practitioners, but all of them are in, in, in uh, primary care. Uh, in certain hospitals, we introduce a, a mixture of Chinese and, and Western medicine together, but still, the main carer is the Western doctor, uh, uh, but since traditionally a lot of people believe in Chinese medicine, so we allow uh, 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 the practice of Chinese medicine in, within uh, those, those elements. It's important for them to communicate and also cooperate rather than a patient going to see a Western doctor and then a Chinese medicine doctor without they knowing each, each other what to give, what have been given. Um, the other areas on, on our international relationship is we have a very broad relationship. We, uh, most of us, particularly those doctors who train in Hong Kong, have opportunity to train overseas. Uh, so we, we, we went to a lot of English-speaking uh, countries, uh, for, for example, US, Canada, uh, Australia, UK, uh, and, and many of the other areas. Uh, and they, they widely travel, and they also have set up certain communication and partnership, particularly in research. Uh, so I think uh, we host a lot of international medical conferences in Hong Kong on a yearly basis, on a regular basis as well. Let's take a few more short questions and answers. Yes, please. What is your view, Professor Chow, on the future of primary care and the role it should have in the Hong Kong system? Um, primary care has not been developed as, as actually as, um, as good as the hospital care in Hong Kong in the past. I'll put it this way. A lot of people would go, try to go to a specialist. If they have something here, they would go, to, go see a cardiologist. If they see something here, they go to see a neurologist. And uh, the GP system is actually uh, quite unregulated for many years. And this is the reason why in the last few years, we put a lot of emphasis in uh, promoting primary care as well as in the private, uh, primary care providers. Uh, and this is the, also something that we think is important. The three, three things that we are doing right now, one is we are setting up a primary care registry, which started earlier this year. Uh, so we are registering all the primary care providers, uh, those who claim to be primary care providers. So, they, okay. so we will give them the right information on the uh, community uh, disease trends and so on, so they, they get much better informed. And they will give them also certain standards of care, which we think is important for the community. And secondly, I think we're developing certain models of care. So we'll be uh, setting up a community health center in, in uh, well, to start one in, the first one in Tin Shui Wai next year. But we try to make this a multidisciplinary center in different districts. And thirdly is um, we're also looking at certain uh, primary care uh, service models for different age groups. So for example, in children, what are the important preventive medicine we need to do? And in, in the elderly, what shall we do? And what are the chronic illnesses that we can care for at the primary care level? Now too many of the so-called specialist clinics are looking after primary care at the same time. I think this happened in many, many countries and many other uh, uh, communities too. Can we take one more question over there? I'm Geetam Tiwari from Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. Uh, WHO recognizes road traffic injuries as a public health problem affecting most of the young people. Does that come under your purview? Uh, you mean road traffic accidents and, and trauma? Yes. yes. Uh, one of the, we, we developed a framework for non-communicable diseases. And actually I chair the uh, committee myself. A few things that we're looking at uh, over the years is some, first of all, something we can prevent. Right? Something you can prevent, actually, if you invest even <coughs> some resources into it, you can actually cut down a lot of the downstream burden of the government. And prevention of injury in terms of uh, various type of uh, traffic accident, industrial accidents is uh, very important. For example, the, the seat belts uh, 
and also the, the, the helmet uh, law in, in, in motorcycle was introduced in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, this would have tremendously cut down a lot of those uh, uh, traffic accidents. In fact, the number of mortality in traffic accident in Hong Kong is actually quite low. Uh, because that might be related to our, our driving speed as well. But this is uh, something that I think uh, we, are, we are concerned with. And we're also working with the 18 districts in Hong Kong to build a healthy city scheme so that um, the district councillors who have a very wide network to within the community, they be able to, uh, through their stakeholders, their supporters, their voters, uh, to, to actually uh, communicate and advise people on uh, some of the risk behavior. So I think this is something that uh, I think is uh, very important. Uh, we have the seven clusters of hospitals all together, 12 hospitals with uh, accident emergency departments. So they can look after injury on a very timely basis, 24 hours, and they have uh, all the specialties that we require. So um, this would cut down the mortality of a, a lot of the injured patients. Okay, you have the final question. Yes, uh, just can I take on uh, mm -hmm. a little bit forward Christine Lowe's comment, which is we have done some mapping, which is pages 38 and 39 of the newspaper. We don't need to look at it now. We can look at it with Khan, which basically identifies hotspots of areas which you would have in any city, but in this case in Hong Kong, of high child mortality or high premature mortality. Does that spatial dimension actually affect your uh, policy in terms of care? It, it does. I think I'd like to thank you for uh, having such a detailed analysis of the different districts of, of uh, health states in Hong Kong. Of course, we need to know the methodology and how it actually come about. But at the same time, this will help us to uh, modify some of our uh, policies, particularly where should we set up a clinic, where should we set up a hospital, uh, where should we uh, focus on health education, and what are the main risks in, in certain communities and so on. So this will be very helpful. So I'd like to thank you for, for doing that. So you will benefit in Hong mm -hmm. Kong from the research at Ellison. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <coughs> thank you very much. Mm -hmm.